We're doing a slight change in running order now, so it is my honour and privilege to ask President Michael D. Higgins to address the group this morning. President Higgins, the stage is yours. Dear friends, a coetra. <clears throat> Insofar as language is part of biodiversity, let me begin with just a few words in our own ancient language. Is min la moika sagwale va sachtan kire a veliv new wakas a sachtan firkin folcha a darish of room he nagas muitik play on over tovak taksha. Good morning, everyone, and I'm abs I was absolutely delighted to receive an invitation to address you today. And I'm equally delighted to stand before what looks like a very diverse group of delegates, the yoga, young people, community groups, farmers and businesses, together with specialists from every facet of the conservation sector. I was anxious to attend this full session to get an idea of the atmosphere of the discussion and where our discourse is now both in terms of Europe and globally. And I was particularly pleased to see that the Director General of the International Union for the Conservation of Na Nature, Inger Andersen, whom I met yesterday, is present here. And I so very much wish her every success in her new responsibilities. And also to have just heard about the Clara Rossa from the European Commission. I think I want to say a few words about the context, if you like, of the discussion that is now taking place, which you have heard is very threatening in relation to biodiversity across all the indicators, but which has some strong indications of light uh, from those who are now taking action. And I, I do want to add a few pieces in as I thought and reflected as I've heard the other speakers. Uh, into my own speech to make a change in saying we have to ask ourselves questions about how deep the changes are that we need now to make. I think it is uh, personally, uh, with, while still staying an optimist, I don't believe we can go on as we are. I also think that there is an intellectual crisis that simply doesn't enable us, there's an intellectual crisis that doesn't address the great gaps in thought uh, that are there. A simple suggestion is we cannot continue to have the current version of development that we have built as it is on as escalation and acceleration. It's a contradiction to say that we can put all of you what you've just heard now into the existing model. The model is flawed, and there is need for a new paradigm of connection between ecology, economics, and ethics. Over the last several years, I have been emphasizing this. Now, things do change. 1992 represented such a hopeful juncture when it seemed that the world was finally coming together to address the existential challenges of our age. And that summit gave impetus to three sister United Nations conventions on climate change, desertification, and biological diversity. And I know that many of you in this room have spent your careers engaging directly or indirectly in pursuit of the objectives of these conventions. And while there have been some notable advances to this end, I think it is fair to say that the agenda of work recognized is far from complete. I was at Rio in 1992, not as a politician, but as a presenter of a documentary. I interviewed some of the major participants. And I remember it well, because it's at Rio that not just those three conventions were agreed, but also that the Business Council for Sustainable Development came into being. And we were 
a fundamental question was posed to those of us as we were coming away. Did this mean that they, the Business Council for Sustainable Development, were going to initiate a whole new wave of changes in relation to the impact of irresponsible corporations on the environment, on vulnerable parts of our planet? They were the most sophisticated people I interviewed, the President, Vice President, and others. And I thought often about this because I would have liked this great change to come into being. But I, others traveling with me would say they saw that the word sustainable was going to be unavoidable now in the discourse. So you could argue that in fact they had simply colonized the new language that was coming out of what was a very rich literature it was at that time we were so far on in the literature and the intellectual side where people were debating between deep ecology and social ecology. And there were journals and books and meetings and seminars. And yet the model of connection between economy, ethics and ecology stayed the same. I thought I remember I had been writing in the 1970s before I went into, in 1992. And I would regularly refer to where the beginning of the great fallacy is. And is in the work of such significant figures as Francis Bacon, who wrote, I lead to you nature and her children in bondage for your use to gouge out her secrets. The model was extractive. The model was in that way, socially totally different. We know that we don't have time today, and I needn't do it. The historical circumstances that led to what such a view led to in terms of cultural systems, those cultural systems that had had a balance with nature, that would go on to this day to refer to it as Tierra Madre, who would refer to it in, in, as she. These ancient wisdoms were perceived and I spent my time as a graduate student listening to how backward such systems were. So I put that preface to what I have to say today. It is a time for respect for wisdom. And it is time for an end to hubris. And it is a time for people to say, this dark cosmos, as Mac Faber referred to it, that has come into being now threatens so much that we must make the effort to open our minds and talk to each other and listen to each other, being able, for example, not referring to people as, I think, as experts. Why not refer to them as specialists so that they can make it easier into the dialogue uh, in conditions of equality? I do want to thank Minister Josepha Madigan and her officials in the Department of Culture, Heritage and the Gaeltacht and the Irish former natural capital for hosting this important event. And it is encouraging to see that the department through its National Parks and Wildlife Service has taken this initiative to help put up biodiversity protection center stage, not only in the public's consciousness, but as importantly in the consciousness of policymakers and officials who deal with a broad range of sectors that have direct impacts on the health of Ireland's biodiversity. And if we are to take the message from the two previous speakers, this area is not just another area. It informs every other area. So therefore, I think the notion that there is some special responsibility attached to finance, for example. If we believe in this, if we are to turn our words into meaningful action and policy, we have to think in an integrated way that there are things that you can't let go. There are things that are very, very urgent. I do very much welcome the announcement made by Minister Madigan yesterday in regard to the increased resources being made available to protect diversity. It is an important move in the right direction, a necessary step in an urgent context. But it will be tested by the experience on the ground. It will be experienced, it is rather like this, I think, too. I had spoken earlier about knowledge systems. There is cognition coming to know. And then coming to know is informed by specialist opinion. 
but in the action of applying it, there is also what is new, what has not been there before. And that is the necessary humility of scholarship delivered into action, so that, for example, farmers will say with confidence, I am doing this not because I, well, it is imposed upon me. I am doing it because it's the right thing to do. And then go on to give you a lecture drawn as much from ancient wisdom as it is drawn from the new information. And I, I, these are mistakes in which, when I was a minister myself, I'm responsible for in relation to perhaps not addressing sufficiently the quality of the, di the dialogue. Some of you present in this room will remember that I once had ministerial responsibility for nature protection. And at that time and since, I have been lauded and indeed condemned in not quite equal measure at times for the actions I took in that role. And while I was not the negotiator of the source directive, I had responsibility for introducing the regulations that first transposed the Habitats Directive into Irish law, and for initiating the process of designating the first of the special areas of conservation under that directive. And over my years in government before and since then, I've gained, I think, some understanding of the challenges that are faced in persuading the political and administrative systems, organized interest groups, and indeed the general public, of the necessity to think long and intergenerationally and act in all our interests to protect our shared environmental, ecological, and climatic assets, assets that there are not infinite. And I have thought of the new dialogue, forms of dialogue uh, that are necessary. And I think those who are directly involved must come to know that the project must be, do their own. Be able to say, as I said, to say, we know, and we know the actions, and we're doing so, and we will be able to teach others. I think that that is so important. I think, as well, the idea in the context we are in relation to the European Union, such a, a view of dialogue, of a new form of discourse, does not threaten anybody. But it does say, and I'm one of those who, who has said it, you can in fact actually kill the best idea by administering it badly. And the form of your relationship to those who are involved is very, very important. And non-state actors have been, I believe, to the forefront in raising our awareness of the issues involved and of the continuing and emerging threats to our environment. The Irish Environmental Network, with a weight of 32 member organisations, 35,000 members, has been a welcome voice in our public discourse on biodiversity loss and has worked constructively with government where circumstances allowed. But it has also served and continues to serve a crucial function by challenging public policy and public authorities when they fall short of what is needed to protect our, our wildlife. And it will not be good enough, really, if we are to be for real in this area, anywhere in Europe into the future, if you have to say, if you regard these issues of habitat as lesser issues, they are as important as the Finance Council. And they, you cannot really be credible if you say, we would like to do this, but we can't. It may be the case, but those who are hearing this message need to know precisely why it isn't the case. This is the whole idea of the idea of allowing citizens of the world to share the world in terms of its complexity, something that isn't happening. This, as I said, I've often quoted Max Faber in this. This is, he said, when you have what comes into being, as he put it, not the invitation of spring, but the cold, icy fingers of winter with its bureaucracy. And as president of Ireland, I've been inspired by the work of communities that are indeed far seen. I've mentioned those 35,000 members of the environmental network, but also those wonderful communities who took it upon themselves to restore wetlands and raise bogs, and the volunteers who are working with Birdwatch Ireland to monitor changes in bird populations, and Untashke with its consistent and well-informed advocacy for nature. And it is crucial in our democracy 
that groups can and do act where they perceive a threat to the common good. But we must try to put an end to the notion that it is a them and us conversation, that, that this is, these are issues that affect us all. And the discourse and the dialogue, if I say to the point of tedium, must be one that addresses the new necess necessary steps that we have to take. It's about sharing information, and it's about listening, and it's about being able to differ with courtesy. I'm encouraged by the quality of academic and research work being undertaken in our colleges, institutes, and universities, about which you'll have heard much yesterday, and hear more later today. The importance of scientifically grounded and evidence-based policy may, is key if we're to successfully meet the changes that confront us. And those in this area of the universities, and coming from a university community myself for so much of my life, they are among the best because they have been going out and spreading their message. And it's very, very important that what we know is communicated, and in our act of communicating it, we revise our knowledge. That's how people go forward, and that is how you get a movement for nature, mother nature. Around the world, of course, as you have heard, the library of life, for that is what it is, that has evolved over billions of years, our biodiversity, is being destroyed, poisoned, polluted, invaded, fragmented, plundered, drained, and burned at a rate not seen in human history. And indeed, some of those corporations, far back in 1992, that were members of the Business Council for Sustainable Development, are the same corporations that said to peasants in Ecuador whose water was poisoned, we will fight you until hell freezes over, and then we'll fight you on the ice, with armies of lawyers ranged against peasants who were representing their village and the children who would be born in it for generations to come. So we have to be for real, and we have to, be, I think, recognise the deep changes that have to be made in many levels if we are to make, if we are to stand, if we are to be, if we are to be authentic. The word that all the young people speak about now, was it authentic? When I stood for election in 1969, and 50 years since that time, our world, including here in Ireland, has witnessed relentless reductions in wildlife populations, in the size and health of the ecosystems they live in, and in the ge genetic diversity of the species themselves. And it is right to call where we are now an extinction crisis, as you've just heard. And it is due to us. Only a quarter of the world's terrestrial surface remains untouched by human hand, and even those places are not escaping the impacts of climate change. It is estimated that human activity has multiplied the normal rate of extinction at least 100-fold. And over the past half century, humanity has witnessed the destruction, as you have heard, of 60% of mammal, bird, fish, and reptile populations around the world. And the examples of how Ireland's our own in our own country, Ireland's biodiversity suffering, are vivid. Our raised and blanket bogs have been systematically degraded through peat extraction, drainage, and inappropriate tree planting. The European eel, which once arrived from the Saragossa Sea to Irish rivers in numbers vast enough to support an industry, is now critically endangered. I do remember as a child in County Clare, person in a local cottage, people competing over who would, in fact, have the right to catch the eels which they sent to London. The beautiful pedal bordered fritterly butterly, butterfly, one of the symbols of the barn to which reference was made, is now endangered. And some of our species' rich grassland habitats have declined by up to 30% in the last decade alone. The corn creek and curlew, which were integral sounds of the Irish countryside, have been pushed into the edge of extinction as breeding species. The hen harrier is suffering habitat loss in its upland terrain under pressure from forestry and wind farm development. The freshwater pearl mussel, once a widespread inhabitant of our pristine rivers and a telltale species of water quality, is now in serious decline in all but bar a handful of sites. Our own government reports that 91% of internationally important habitats in Ireland have bad or inadequate conservation status. 
and studies over the past five years have shown that of 202 species of commonly occurring birds in Ireland, an alarming 63% are now on the red and amber lists of birds of conservation concern. 30% of Ireland's wild bee species are threatened with extinction, and studies suggest that we in Ireland are losing butterflies and bees at a faster rate than the rest of the world. If we were coal miners, we would be up to our knees in dead canaries. And I think you're standing at the back of what I have just been saying is this intellectual reluctance to have a meaningful, informed, philosophically informed, ethically informed debate on development. A debate on, for example, is it possible to achieve anything of what you have heard so far this morning in conditions of continual relentless escalation and at a human level in relation to ever encouraged insatiable consumption? Of course it is not. But that has a huge issue, raises a whole series of issues which, are, which can be addressed elsewhere. For example, if you wanted to have a static universe that where you could achieve most of these issues, it has implications for economic policy, which we can deal with at another time. We are the first generation to truly comprehend the reality of what we are doing to the natural world, and we may be the last with the chance to avert much of the damage. And with this knowledge comes an extraordinary burden of responsibility that we all share. And as I look around, I must say the fullness of this room, I'm heartened to see the faces of the people who have accepted that responsibility with open arms, passion and commitment. And I'm struck by their sense of determination when I meet them. In the, often I meet them in the, in the face of their difficulties. And too often like Cassandra heralding the fall of Troy, they have struggled to be listened to and their warnings have gone unheeded. And they were often viewed too as an inconvenient voice, a crank or an obstacle to what some call progress. It has been suggested that they weren't realistic. What is realistic about pursuing destruction or bad policies? NGOs, individual citizens, and concerned voices within the public service have too frequently been greeted with a dismissive disdain as purveyors of a lesser argument when they pointed to the environmental consequences of a proposed course of action. And today, these previously dismissed or excluded voices are the voices that must be listened to. Their testimony is the testimony of the informed, of the specialist adducing empirical evidence, of those not simply representing a particular political or sectoral interest, and they will be increasingly vital in bringing our decision-making processes to the simple understanding that what damages nature's interest damages the interests of all, including future generations. We cannot achieve sustainable development if we do not change our mindset, change our approach, and achieve a symmetry, again repeated, between ecology, economics, and ethics. And we must teach that. And politicians and public servants must equip themselves with the necessary expertise to adequately represent our citizens' interests, engage in dialogue in this regard, if we are to reverse the astonishing degradation we've witnessed in our habitats and species. Nature conservation must become a central preoccupation within agriculture, Land use planning, forestry, energy, flood relief management, transport and fisheries, policy and practice, to name but a few. There must be a biodiversity test to policy in these areas. Then there is need, too, for flexibility. We cannot continue with some decisions being taken in one silo that are regarded as not, in, not involving those in another silo. We have to be able to move across boundaries in relation to administration and financing. I think I've, there are so many. We cannot succeed when, when those who oversee the sectors and those who are engaged within them understand the threat, accept the need to change our approach, and act in our collective interest. This must be a realization to which everyone must come. We must achieve a situation far beyond one that will give us endless confrontations with, between those with different views. I really do, I'm so, so admire 
those who communities individuals were springing forward to clean a beach, restore a bog, the nature friendly gardeners, the tidy towns committees, the 7,000 citizens who've been submitting hundreds of thousands of records to the National Biodiversity Data Centre collating these and many other biodiversity records, and in doing so, strengthening the linkages between conservation scientists, civil society, and government agencies. And I was glad reference was made to the burn. The success of the innovative farm-led programs such as Burn Life and Aran Life are so valuable, where the important role of farmers as custodians of the land was acknowledged and respected and where the European Union and government departments have shown that they can work together in the interests of conservation. And there's a huge difference between the announcement of a program and when a farmer can say, I am doing this because I believe it's the right thing to do, and be able to tell you why, drawing not only on the detail of the scheme, but also on the ancient practices that bound him and his ancestors to nature. And I think that these are, this is all very welcome. But I just wonder very much, too, are we making the best use of the significant level of public money that we are spending on environmental measures in the agricultural sector? And whether we're doing enough to harness the goodwill of farmers towards biodiversity protection? And can we improve this? And I think that assessment of the benefits of the existing farming subsidies has been fairly weak. Farmers and foresters must be clearly encouraged away from what we know are damaging practices and encouraged towards farming in harmony with nature. And in this regard, there is a critical role for the European Commission and for our own authorities in creating the context in which Irish farmers can move quickly towards truly sustainable agriculture. The All-Ireland Pollinator Plan is an example of exceptional public engagement and its success in raising awareness and stimulating action for the plight of our pollinators is unparalleled. And I'm hoping that even in Oris and Uktron, we can become more involved in this initiative soon. We must remember too that the wealth of biodiversity in our marine waters Recent surveys by the Marine Institute and the National Parks and Wildlife Service have mapped habitats as deep as 300 metres, revealing escarpments, sea mounds and cold water coral reefs. Meanwhile, the enormous undertaking of the OBSERVE programme has seen the mapping of whales, dolphins and seabirds across hundreds of thousands of kilometres of our seas. We've never known so much as we do today about the world around us and its wonder and the curiosity we can have for it. And like many others, I've been impressed by the brilliant cinematography, the passionate presentation of recent nature documentaries, Wild Ireland, The Edge of the World, Eco Eye, Living the Wildlife, Wild Cities, among others. And they are vital in bringing the wonders in modern communications technology of our wildlife into view, but also in alerting us to the dangers that it faces. And they're reminding us of what we are losing as a consequence of existing practices that fallaciously see such resources as inexhaustible. Our natural world and the crisis it is currently undergoing demands more and more of this type of coverage and dissemination to help the public appreciate the urgency of action to prevent its destruction. And I'm encouraged that these issues are being picked up within mainstream journalism. For example, in the Sunday Business Post last weekend, Tom McGurk had very interesting and stark things to say in an article entitled, Insect Apocalypse is a wake-up call for us all. And most of us probably have developed our fascination with nature in early childhood. For some of us, that wonder diminishes me as we grow up, and it is a tragedy, and become distracted by life's preoccupations. But for many, it remains dormant, and it is there ready to be awakened. The enduring popularity of nature programmes is surely a testament to this curiosity and wonder that can be used to rekindle people's innate fascination for and interest in nature, and hopefully it may engender a general awareness of the importance of protecting nature. 
And this is connected to matters cultural. We need only think of an brother and fassa, the salmon of knowledge, the children of Lir, Toriak, Girmatas, Gronia, for evidence that if a time where we were far more comfortable and in tune with the world around us, where we were not in violent contestation with nature, but we were in symmetry, in shared imagination. And in this 21st century, more and more people are now living in urban centres that seem far removed from the natural world. And in rural Ireland, how many of us take time, really, to notice the changes that are happening all around? In many ways, and I don't want to sound too pessimistic, but it is necessary, I think, to be honest, to say it is part of the hubris of that which we have titled modern civilization, modernity, modern consumption and life, and how we have allowed it to develop. We have come to see ourselves as somehow separate from nature, or as I said at times in violent competition with it, or even the assumption that we inhabit a distinct ecosystem that is immune from the damage that we are causing all around us. And the strides we've made over the past hundred years in the provision of healthcare, education, transport and information technology have not prevented us from at the same time wreaking havoc in the natural world a world in which we rely for water, for food, for well-being. We have been living an incredible contradiction in this regard. The more we eat into this natural capital, the less resilient we will be to the shocks that we know we should expect. That is the essence of an unsustainable, unhealthy system of living, a system that for all our sakes must change. And at a broad level, I observe that our society and economy do not seem to comprehend the extent to which we rely on nature, its renewal and resilience. This has already been dealt with by a previous speaker. But we really are at a tipping point. In fact, we've often and still continue to provide perverse incentives that reward environmentally damaging activities rather than discouraging them, allowing the degradation of a commonly held resource for a short-term expediency for the profit of the few. And really significant political po politics in the future <coughs> will be the politics of the short term versus the politics of the long term. I've been vocal in my view that there is a gross inadequacy in our current economic orthodoxy to either understand or to address the existential challenges that confront the world today. Economic discourse must ask why is it putting barriers to the entry of ecological thinking, or indeed social economics itself. And the institutions that support the narrow view have serious questions to answer as to what they are offering by way of what, how in fact actually they are damaging policy formation. Economic models that have championed the unsustainable path on which we have been hurtling are inadequate to guide us towards the necessary realignment, as I've said, of economics, ecology, and ethics, towards the new paradigms that will allow us to achieve the sustainable development objectives we signed up to in New York in 2015 and the Paris Accord on Climate Change in the same year. There is far from a hospitable welcome, I can tell you, for critique of models that are threatening our very future. It, it's sad. I'm all the more encouraged, therefore, to learn of that work that is going on to address biodiversity loss within some economic systems. The work of the Irish Forum on Natural Capital to make nature's value to people more visible in economic and political decision making. The idea that nature constitutes a form of capital that is no less for legitimate, for inclusion in policy formation or models of financial capital or manufactured capital, and that the economy and indeed society is wholly dependent on it and should value and account for that dependency is a crucial one. It's a useful one that must be taken up on a much broader level. It is one approach and not an exclusive one. There are other approaches that sit side by side with it, derived from ethics. And while it's undeniable that nature has as much of a right to be here as we do, and that we should protect it for its own sake, it is simultaneously true that saving the planet is not only about saving nature, it is about saving humanity. And the time frame in which we must transform our world into one that makes space for a recovered respect for nature is perilously short. And every opportunity to infect the needed changes must be seized. I think it is very, very important that there is an enormous quantity, quality, and diversity of expertise in this room 
You are biodiversity's greatest allies, and Ireland needs to hear what you are telling us. And you as an expertise, I prefer to regard it as a specialism that we need, and it needs more attention, telling us that climate change and biodiversity loss are happening at an alarming rate, that they are interconnected, and that action is needed to arrest both, telling us, and I agree, that there is an urgent need to elevate the agenda for biodiversity conservation, as well as the climate change agenda, both here in Ireland and in the international context. And reversing that loss, biodiversity loss, will require all of us to be frank in our discussions, to be leaders within our own spheres of influence, in our homes, our places of work, our circles of friends, our schools and universities, in our communities of place and of faith, because there is a profound spirituality that supports respect for Mother Nature to demonstrate the message that our biodiversity, our natural heritage, is our right but also now, in these conditions, our responsibility. And of course, government has a particular responsibility. In responding to all of this and setting appropriate policy frameworks, representing the long-term common good. And it is with government, ultimately, that responsibility rests. But government needs encouragement to that end and needs help in seeking a common purpose between farmers, field ecologists, corporations, conservationists, politicians, rangers, agricultural specialists, community groups, all working together with generosity, patience, understanding, and hope too, and a discourse that encourages hope. Ireland has taken many strides in the past century, and our citizens know on a deeper level than most that unity and doing things together, like Frastel and Balakena, walking the same street in the same direction, even if we differ, our goals are what should unite us and motivate us to keep moving through the fog of conflicting interests. Do we want to be the generation who knew the scale of the loss and understood its profound and irreversible social, cultural, political, economic, environmental and ethical consequences and did nothing? I believe no. Do we want to be the people who saw the trajectory of business as usual and said, we will change, we can do better? I believe we want to do that. As President of Ireland, it is my role to represent the citizens of this country, not only for now, but as much as possible, in protection of their imagined futures. And I would like to say to you, the conservation community, and its friends and allies, I will seek to amplify your voice and be with you together as a nation as we seek out a new horizon for nature. And I so wish you every success in your deliberations at this inaugural National Diversity Con Biodiversity Conference. I thank you again for your information, for your, for your invitation, and for your patience in listening to my calls. Guim Graharif, Berbana, Agus Mila Buikas, Don I wish you so much success for the future.